Dear friends, religion has played a decisive role in the understanding of human life and the surrounding world. It is one of the defining marks of human species. Humans not only create religion, but to a great extent are created by it. On one side, religion has inspired people to live holy lives to do selfless deeds and even extraordinary acts of virtue. For example, some people have courageously sacrificed their lives as a witness to their unconditional love of God. However, on the other side, particularly with the rise of fanaticism today, religion is often accused of disturbing the peace of the globe expressing his sharp critic against religious fanatics who perpetuate violence in the name of God, British thinker Jonathan Sachs beautifully says, too often in the history of religion, people have killed in the name of God of life, hated in the name of God of love and compassion. When this happens, God speaks beneath the clamor of those claiming to speak on his behalf. What he says at such times is, not in my name. Further on, the understanding and credibility of religion is greatly influenced by developments in other fields of inquiry. Among these various disciplines, the phenomenal discoveries and innovative inventions in science and technology have immense impact on the value of religion. Believing that religion fosters fanaticism and scientific developments undermine the relevance of religion, many people, particularly in the West, have embraced a lifestyle that keeps away religion and God from their daily lives. The common expression that summarizes this way of living is, oh, we have become secular. We hear some people saying, rather with a sense of pride, I do not go to the church or the temple or the mosque. I do not believe in religious rituals. Religious ceremonies are meaningless to me. I even don't like to pray etc. Hence, friends, secularism seems to be the current fashionable ideology that appears as a new remedy for the so-called ailments of religion. So this lecture, entitled Religion and Secularism, tries to answer two main questions. First, is secularism against religion or God? Second, the preamble of our Indian constitution begins with the words, We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India as a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. Now friends, does secular here mean that the Indian constitution mandates its citizens to leave out religion from their daily lives? I have divided this lecture into three main parts. First, the understanding of religion and secularism. Second, Indian secularism. Third, practical implications. In dealing with these three sections, I have relied 
mainly on the insights of three renowned thinkers. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, Spanish-born sociologist of religion Jose Casanova, and Indian political theorist Rajiv Bhargwa. Let's take the first part, understanding of religion and secularism. Secularism is essentially connected with the concept of religion. So to understand secularism, we need to know what we mean by religion. Now at the very outset, I will humbly admit that to give a strict definition of religion is a challenging task. Although friends, we use the word religion so commonly in our daily lives, it involves such a huge variety that it becomes difficult to pinpoint what is essential and what is accidental to it. For instance, as soon as we hear the word religion, the first thing that comes to our mind is the word God. And so we might be tempted to define religion as an institution that involves belief in God. But Buddhism, which almost everyone accepts to be a religion, does not believe in God and hence would not be qualified to be termed as religion. And this sounds absurd. To carry forward our discussion, I will proceed by taking refuge in the famous words of philosopher Michael Polanyi, who said, We know more than we can say. Hence, though we might not be able to say what exactly and precisely religion is, I am sure all of us know what religion is. So for our understanding, we might explain religion as a system of beliefs and practices which are adhered by a moral community in order to promote good and virtuous life. Now, what is secularism? People commonly believe that to be secular means to be indifferent to religion, if not against it. So, secular implies simply to be opposite of religious or that what is non-religious. But friends, did the term secular always mean this? A simple historical analysis shows three different shades of relationship between religious and secular, namely engagement, disengagement, and non-involvement. First, engagement or enriching friendship. It is interesting to note that the term secular has emerged first as the theological category of Western Christendom. Secular, from the Latin seculum, means belonging to this time or age. So seculum or secular was used to distinguish this limited time-bound world from the eternal realm of God or heaven. Eventually, in the medieval period, based on the religious secular distinction, we have two worldviews, the religious secular world of salvation and the secular profane world. Accordingly, the clergy was divided into religious clergy who lived in monasteries away from the world and led a life of Christian asceticism, for example, the Carmelites, and the secular clergy who lived in the world with the laity to sanctify the world, for example, the diocesan priests. Thus, friends, in its original theological meaning, to secularize meant to convert religious persons or things into secular ones. For example, a religious priest decides to leave the monastic life in order to live as a diocesan priest living in the world. So early Christian secularization aimed to bring the religious life out of the monasteries so that all live a life based on gospel and Christian values. Hence, we can say 
that Christian spirituality try to eliminate the dualism between religious and secular by taking the religious secular and the secular religious through mutual reciprocal infusion. The second relationship, disengagement or unhealthy separation. Certain developments in the world, particularly in the West, during the modern period, that is, from the 15th century AD onwards, transformed the distinction between religious and secular into a somewhat bitter separation between the church and the state. The Renaissance, the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution led some people to place absolute trust in the human ability to arrive at truth without divine help. Truth can be attained through free rational means without believing in any authority like the church. For example, due to developments in science, people realize that natural calamities like floods have natural causes and there is no need to involve God there. Some scientists too express their displeasure towards church's teachings in matters related to science. This is clearly seen in scientist Laplace's famous reply to Emperor Napoleon. I do not believe in that hypothesis of God for the explanation of the universe. However, secularism as a distinct ideology first originated in the 19th century Europe with English thinker George Holyoke. In 1850, he coined the word secularism to distance the state and the church. Secularism was essentially meant to seek human development by material means, that is, by using secular sciences like mathematics, physics, chemistry, without any reference to God. It is essential to note that though he wanted to establish a social order independent of religion, he was not anti-religious. However, Holyoke's close associate Charles Bradlaugh, an atheist, had a bitter attitude towards the church and religion. And he believed that secularism must be against religion for progress is impossible so long as superstition, which he believed was promoted by religion, remains in the world. So secularism has to fight superficiality that he thought was inherent in religious expressions. The third relationship, non-involvement or mutual exclusion. As discussed above, from the early centuries, we see two different meanings of secularism. One referring to differentiation between religious and secular or between the church and the state, and the other is that of bitter separation between the two. Today, mostly in the West, secularism is seen as a mutual exclusion wherein religion and state are not to interfere in each other's affairs. And this non-involvement is essential for the well-being of every citizen, irrespective of his or her religion. So today, a secular state is one that guarantees to the citizens freedom of religion, deals with them irrespective of their religious affiliation and the state is not constitutionally bound to any particular religion, nor does it commit itself to promote or to interfere with religion. So currently, secularism seems to believe that freedom and neutrality are essential for the development of every citizen in particular and the state in general. So friends, to summarize the understanding of secularism, I will say that, firstly, it is important to note 
that secularism is an idea that has Western origin. Secondly, secularism does not have one single meaning, but it involves a rich diversity of understanding. Thirdly, this variety should not be sacrificed or compromised, but acknowledged and respected. The second main part, Indian secularism. Although from the Western perspective, we have discussed three versions of secularism, currently among the three, the last two captured people's minds. Today, the term secular is either seen as unhealthy separation between religion and state or mutual exclusion of religion from the affairs of the state. However, the Indian understanding of secularism is quite unique and hence differs considerably from the Western context. When the preamble of the Indian constitution states that India is a secular republic. It seeks to describe the relationship that exists or which ought to exist between state and religion. This relationship between the two can be described as having four main features. First, the state should not have any religion of its own or as its official religion. Second, all religions are accepted, respected, and equally protected by the state as its obligatory and sacred duty. Third, the state grants equally to all its citizens the free exercise of the right to freedom of religion. Fourth, the state shall not discriminate against any particular religion, implying that the government shall not prefer to favor or to disfavor any particular religion vis-a-vis -vis the others. So friends, an insightful look at the above four features shows how Indian secularism is unique and enriching. Unlike the Western, the Indian version does not imply a strict bitter separation of religion and state. The government has to positively protect equally all religions. Though it denotes a state of neutrality towards all religions, the state has to recognize the value of all religion, respect all religions, and above all, uphold religious diversity. Indian secularism also differs from the Western one, which demands non-involvement and non-interference of governmental institution in religion and vice versa. In contrast, Indian law upholds the right for practice and propagation of one's own religion and also the right to be educated in it. Educational institutions, wholly owned and operated by the government, may not impart religious teachings. But sects and organizations may open their own schools, impart religious values, and have a right to partial state financial assistance. So to summarize the Indian understanding, we could say that Indian secularism seeks to maintain a principal distance as well as a relationship between the state and the religion. This implies that both recognize they are different. They respect each other's areas of authority and they value each other and avoid destructive interference in each other's domains. The last part, practical implications. Friends, after having a critical look at religion, at secularism, 
and its various nuances in the Western context and its uniqueness to our religion. I would like to draw a few practical insights to enlighten our mind and benefit our daily lives. First, the main teachings of all religion inspire us to value every human person, to foster peace and unity in the society, and promote justice, equality, and well-being of all. Hence, it is essential to have a sound knowledge of our own religion and that of the other, to honor the wisdom and to fight against those who misuse religion for their vested interests. Second, friends, religion is never against scientific advancement as God is the source of all knowledge and wisdom. Thus, the growing increase in scientific knowledge is never a threat to the relevance of religion. On the contrary, scientific mindset helps to evaluate our faith, deepen it, and make it more relevant, valuable, and transforming. Third, Secularism, whether seen as mutual enrichment or separation or even non-involvement, is always for enhancing the dignity of the human person and the betterment of the society. So, if it fails in this regard, then we need to re-evaluate our understanding of secularism. Fourth, if Indian secularism is seen only as an ideology that seeks to separate religion and state, it will be inappropriate, unjust, and misleading in a country where the majority of the people are very religious, or religiosity is embedded in the very culture. Lastly, in a country like India, numerical supremacy of one religion may predispose it to disfavor or even to oppress religions which are smaller in number. Secularism thus can serve to protect religious minorities from discrimination and persecution. Friends, to conclude this lecture, I would like to say with conviction that religion is God's blessing to humanity. It makes life meaningful, beautiful, and fruitful. Spirituality or religious nature is deeply rooted in humans. And so secularism, understood as a hostile separation between the state and religion, will lead to injustice to both. So, friends, instead of splitting them, it will be essential to explore ways to relate them constructively, to avoid mutual harm, and to promote common well-being. Thank you, and may God bless you. Mm -hmm.